Hello everyone. Today I've been asked to do two things. One is to declare my conflicts of interest on this opening slide. The second is to talk about lab origins and one hypothesis in particular which we call the Mojang minus passage theory. The word passage here refers to the virological technique of moving a virus, usually between organisms, in order to progressively adapt it to a new host. Our theory proposes that an equivalent process happened inside the lungs of miners following a mystery disease outbreak in 2012. Before going further, I do want to direct you to the articles noted on this slide. These contain specific details and scientific references to support the points covered in this talk. After a brief overview, I will also present some analysis that is new and thus not fully elaborated in those links. I also want to be clear that there are other lab origin theories. The key distinction of the Mojang Minor Passage theory is that all other theories assume that the creation of SARS-2 by lab manipulation or viral passaging began with one or more bat viruses acquired in nature. The Mojang Minor Passage Theory, in contrast, proposes that the virus that leaked originated from a medical sample obtained from the miners affected by the outbreak. But first, why is a lab origin being considered for COVID-19? In short, because the world's leading center for bat coronavirus research is in Wuhan, and the closest known wild relative of SARS-2 came from a bat. Second, because the many zoonotic origin theories proposed to date, from frozen fish to pangolin intermediates, are not supported by significant evidence. This slide lists some key questions to be answered by any origin theory. So we lack an explanation of why the virus broke out in Wuhan. We also need to know why there was only one spillover event. So a single spillover event is a red flag for a lab escape. Why was the first isolated SARS-2 virus so well adapted to humans? How did SARS-2 acquire a furin cleavage site in its spike protein when none of its close relatives have one? And why has no intermediate animal host been found? And more specific to the Mojang Miners and the Mojang Miner theory, are the facts that when researchers from the Wuhan Institute of Virology published the genome sequence of this virus, RATG13, which is the closest known wild relative of SARS-2, did they not mention that they had been researching this virus since they found it in 2013? And why also did they fail to mention that this virus was found at the site of a suspected coronavirus outbreak? So this is the Mojang mine outbreak. And so why also did they rename RATG13 without noting its prior published name? All of these activities appear to be uh, uh, actions designed to hide the connections between the outbreak and SARS-2 and RATG13. The theory we have proposed originated with a discovery barely mentioned in the scientific literature of a disease outbreak in 2012. In this outbreak, three miners died and three became sick at the Mojang copper mine in Yunnan, China. All six miners had COVID-19-like symptoms and were diagnosed tentatively with an unknown coronavirus. We also know from subsequent sampling that bat coronaviruses were abundant in and near the mine. They were very diverse and very numerous. We also know that the miners were shoveling bat guano, which provides a cover, a connection rather, with the bats. And we also know that the miners underwent a lengthy hospitalization. So this approach they were sick, essentially two of them at least, were sick for about six months. And our proposal is that these 
uh, this lengthy hospitalization and illness allowed the evolution of a novel human-adapted coronavirus from the bat viruses to which they were exposed. We also know that many medical samples were taken from the miners, and some of them were sent to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So a key question becomes, what was in the samples and what was done with any viruses found? Now we need to understand, it needs to be understood, that this outbreak caused a lot of consternation and interest in China. And in part it was an interest to the Wuhan Institute of Virology because it validated their theories on uh, viruses jumping from bats into people and so it would have been a high priority research subject. And any viruses done, any uh, research done with these viruses would have included sequencing them, culturing them, and cloning them. And our proposal, the Moj Minor Passage proposal, is that that virus, the viruses that were being manipulated in the lab to do this culturing and sequencing, eventually jumped out and caused the pandemic. And this doesn't preclude the idea that they may subsequently have been engineered, but it's not necessarily a, a necess necessary part of the theory. So what we have proposed is that, that, that is a theory that we have proposed. But before I, want to before I finish up, I want to elaborate on a key aspect of the theory that some have had difficulty accepting but which is also of strong practical medical interest. So the minor Passard's theory proposes that many hundreds of mutations arose inside the body of a single hospitalized minor, thereby converting a related wild bat virus into SARS-2, or at least a virus very similar to it. I.e., that decades of normal coronavirus evolution were crammed into about six months. How plausible is that? In a previous BMJ COVID Unknowns webinar on new viral variants, Professor Gupta of Cambridge University discussed the surprising phenomenon shown in this slide of isolated cases of greatly accelerated evolution. So this slide plots the sampling date of UK viruses against their divergence from Wuhan 1 the first published SARS-2 virus. The lower line thus shows viruses in Britain evolving over time to become progressively more different from the Wuhan strain. But in September, there occurred a sudden evolutionary jump of 23 mutations to the upper line, which then reverts to the original evolutionary trajectory. From then on, the B117 lineage formed in the jump becomes more numerous, displacing the viruses comprising the lower slope. This is a truly dramatic evolutionary leap. The accepted explanation for it is that B117 arose entirely within a solitary, probably immunocompromised individual who harbored the virus for an extended period before transmitting it. But the key observation here is that as much evolution occurred in that one individual as had occurred in the literary millions of infections in the rest of the country since the entire pandemic began. How could that happen? Professor Gupta noted that the patients he studied and who also exhibited very rapid bursts of evolution were immunocompromised. But that is surely not the false story. What needs to be appreciated about individuals who harbor COVID-19 for a long period is that they accumulate a large diversity of viruses. This is in contrast to typical infections. Normally, cases acquire from their contact a very small number of similar or identical viruses and pass on an identical or near identical virus within a few days. Thus, infected individuals accumulate limited genetic diversity and pass on hardly any even of this. Consequently, every five or so days the virus passes through a severe genetic bottleneck. 
The same is not true for patients harboring the virus for long periods. In their bodies, genetic diversity builds and builds. What we further know is that coronaviruses recombine very frequently, i.e. multiple times in every infected cell. What that means for virus evolution is that when adaptive mutations arise, although they arise independently <clears throat> in different viral genomes, recombination lets them combine into a single genome. Recombination thus explains how the 23 mutations in B117 came together in one virus. So although recombination also occurs in ordinary infections, because the viral diversity is limited, its evolutionary consequences are minimal. Thus only in long-term infections does high diversity synergize with recombination to accelerate virus evolution in an exponential fashion. One additional factor needs to be considered. Successful and significant viral mutations rarely arise alone. Rather, adaptive mutations are usually synergistic or compensatory with other mutations, meaning at least two mutations must arise approximately simultaneously. This is because proteins, like the COVID spike protein, of three-dimensional structures. So changes arising in one position are often only adaptive if they occur simultaneously with changes occurring elsewhere in the protein or even the virus. Some of the new variants show this tendency for cooperativity very clearly. The B1427 California variant of concern, for example, is characterized by two mutations. S13i and W152C that are found in a region of the spike called the N-terminal domain. In the Wuhan strain, these two amino acids act independently. But in one B1427, both mutations are present together and a new covalent chemical bond forms that remodels the whole N-terminal domain to resist the binding of antibodies. But only when viral diversity is high, as in long-term patients, is it likely that recombination will bring together mutations in pairs or in novel clusters to create successful novel forms and new variants. All of this has practical medical implications. Doctors need to be aware that immunocompromised long-term patients, COVID patients, present special dangers. The implication for our Mojang Miner's Passage theory is that these instances of hyperevolution make it easier to show, make it far easier, to see how decades of evolution can be telescoped into an extended hospital stay of a single immunocompromised miner especially when we consider that the miners were infected with one or more bat viruses and also that zoonotic jumps are known to independently accelerate viral evolution. Our theory does not, however, preclude subsequent lab manipulation, as I said earlier. So we propose the Mojang Miners Passage theory, as we have always done, because it have, provides plausible answers for the key questions that surround the origin of COVID-19. But I will end with this slide, which indicates some remaining questions and where we think crucial new data may yet come from. So I will close there and thank you very much for your attention.